starting it. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, lax rats alike, welcome back to another episode of the Crease Dive. Today is Monday, September 25th, and the Archers are your 2023 Premier Lacrosse League champions of the world after the Archers come out victorious with a 15 to 14 win over the water dogs in the final minutes of the championship game. I'm Jordy from Barstool with me as always. We've got my good friend and yours on the mic. We've got Dukes in the lab Dukes. What a weekend for the cross. What a game out of the archers tough scene for the water dogs, but they'll be back hungrier than ever. How are we feeling after the 2023 PLL season has wrapped up? Hungover, disgusting, tired, um but more or less another season in the books uh what a great game it's all it's what lacrosse is all about i always say it's a game of runs you go up six in the first quarter in the pll you know a team like the water dogs is going to make a comeback i never had any doubt about that that they make it a good ball game um two of the best teams in the league it had to come down to that wish there maybe wasn't as much uh uh, i'll tease it i wish i wish it wasn't a little bit of a ref show not like the archers did anything wrong or like they got calls one way or another just in critical points of the game you think that if a ref messed up in the final four they kind of get it right down the stretch in a big time professional game but it didn't seem to be the case but besides that fantastic season both these teams deserve to be champions in my in my in my opinion um it was cool to see the archer storyline play out and their all season shifts turn into gold glory uh happy to see my good friend mac o'keefe lift up the trophy but yeah it was a sick game I mean, Philly's built of champions, uh, another good crowd in Philly. It was sick. It was a good game. Good, Great weekend. Great barbecue weekend. Shout out to Jordy for uh, cooking it up. It was a great time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the whole weekend in general was, uh, was pretty great. So, uh, one, big thanks to anyone who came out to the Barstool Bar on Saturday night for the Barstool Smokeout. Uh, was able to put together – I think, think the final total was probably close to like 100 pounds of meat. We did six briskets, four massive pork butts, some ribs, some sausage. Uh, so it was real fun getting a chance to cook for everybody who showed out there. Uh, I mean, listen, weather-wise this weekend, maybe a little less than ideal. Uh, but yeah, the, the crowd in Philly still showed out. Still got a, a good little crowd there for the, uh, for the pregame tailgate. Uh, it, I mean, RIP to my – I decided to wear white vans – to a to a rainy tailgate like an absolute schmuck big time rookie move out of me um yeah. so you know paul, paul and mike rabel you guys will get an invoice in the mail at some point i do need to buy a new pair of vans after mine got absolutely destroyed uh at that tailgate but yeah everything leading up to the game was awesome but i think we knew the whole weekend the main event water dogs versus archers the best two like clearly the best two teams in the league this year um who have already provided us with two of the best games of the summer already uh we knew that they were going to show out for this one and if i had one bugaboo about the whole weekend it's that i feel like these two teams deserve to have at least like a best of three series to figure out who the champion was going to be um I mean, both these teams just so tight all year, so good all year, so dominant. And I mean, for this game to come down to one, like everyone knew it was going to be a one goal game, right? Because the previous two were one goal games. Um, Even, you know, the whole time when the Archers were up by six in the first and second quarter, somewhere in the back of your head and, and Dukes, this was coming out the front of your mouth. We're saying the water dogs are coming back in this one. That's, that's a guarantee. Yeah. It's I'm big on, Water finding its level. So if you start out really hot, you're a hot goalie. Like even Dobson, MVP, 58% save percentage, played out of his hole. It's not like in the second half he was playing like the first quarter. The first quarter, some of the saves that he was making, just getting pieces of stuff, won them the game. Like the fact that they were able to build to like an 8-2 lead was critical. Um, but yeah, like like I said, I think seeing Sisselberger kind of dominate the act with the way that the – Water Dogs were able to stop him by forcing turnovers. That was a big goal by him. So they were locking people off. You, you called that. Um, so that was a huge goal by Sis. The game in general was so much fun. I think it's exactly how you kind of want a lacrosse game to be played. During a football game, it's like you want 48 minutes or whatever it is, like an hour of just back and forth football. You're thinking like the Chiefs-Ram Monday night game, just like, wow, offense is a stop. 
good stops on defense, back and forth play. But in lacrosse, I, I like the I like the pulling back from the comebacks, the one goal stops, the the chase outs. I mean, I was I'm not mad that the archers won because I know that people are probably gonna attach me to like, oh, you're a water dogs guy, blah 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 blah. But really, it's just like I hate how. I guess I don't hate how the archers won. I hate how there can now be a narrative, like the the refs blew a couple calls in critical moments of the games. Like it, it doesn't feel like I'm not. Nobody's putting an asterisk next to it, but I hope there's a there's there could be an argument to be made or a dialogue out there now. Yeah, I think uh, so. So a couple points that you made there. I mean, one, I totally agree with you. Where you know, and we talked about this before, like a constant back and forth, it's almost too much in the game of lacrosse, right? Because it's just nonstop action anyway. And if it's just back and forth, yo-yoing between who's up, who's down the whole time, it's almost like too much to, to keep up with the entire game. Like it, it is nice where you have portions of the game, like almost like, I mean, this game, this, this championship game, like it had chapters to it, right? Like e- each quarter kind of told a different story, um, which was really, you know, that, that first quarter archers domination out of the gate, um, second quarters, you know, still archers domination early, but then you started to get a little bit of the comeback towards the end of that second quarter, uh, for the water dogs third quarter. It was like, Holy shit. Like we are in like, you know, no pun intended here, like a dog fight, like this game's going to come down to pretty much the final possession. Um, and then, yeah, that, I mean, that fourth quarter was, was incredible couple. I mean, Big goals out of a lot of different guys out there, like Jake Carraway. What a what a performance out of Jake Carraway. Um, the angriest shooter, I think, in the league. Like there are some guys who are probably a little bit more accurate than Jake Carraway. There are some guys who probably shoot it a little bit harder than Jake Carraway. But like in terms of like guys who like it just every time the ball leaves his stick, it's like, wow, that guy's like really pissed off at something. Like something's eating this guy alive. And like he like takes it all out on the shots. Um, and then a sell these afterwards. So um, and then obviously a big goal out of Tom Schreiber to, to close everything out, not without clock controversy. And this is, this is a nice, I love that Tom Schreiber, uh, kind of has, this is his bit, right? Like this is his almost like a running theme of his, uh, to score big time game winners in championship games that have a, a little bit of a clock controversy attached to it. So we saw it. 2018 in Israel when he scored the game winner in the gold medal for USA against Canada in the world games where, you know, a lot of Canadians out there still a little butthurt saying that, you know, maybe, maybe that should have came after the buzzer. Um, and then this one and, and Dukes, I don't know if you have this dialed up yet, uh, but you know, there was a little bit of a clock controversy there in terms of the shot clock on whether or not the archers deserve to get a full reset uh, off a shot that a lot of people are saying never ended up hitting. Uh, I, I guess it would have been DeLuca in that at that point because Dylan Ward, uh, shout out Dylan Ward, uh, unfortunately going down with an injury towards the end of that game. So uh, always hoping for a speedy recovery for that guy. But, uh, you know, the archers get a, a full reset on the shot clock, final two minutes of the game. You can you can say whether or not they deserve to get it. Uh, a lot of people saying maybe that ball hit off of Ben Randall. Either way, uh, Archers they they mm. got the full reset. They got the timeout. They go out there, and Tom Schreiber proved why he's the best player in the world. Um, and you know, just absolute splash job with the game winner. Can you hear this? I cannot hear it. No. All right, so I'll just turn it off on my end then. But you could just see that, like. But, but I think that some people were saying before, like not even the fact that the shot clock got s- started late. Right. But I think a lot of people were saying before, because they had the full 32 that like that they shouldn't have had 32 to start with after that timeout that they got, they got a reset because. It hit Randall's stick, not, not to yeah. Lucas. It was right. to Lucas would warrant. So. And here's the thing. At first, I was like, all right, like, who, I didn't really see what was going on in real time because, like, you just don't hear the broadcast. And, like, I'm not staring at the shot clock. I know that might like, shock people. Not really looking. I'm, I'm on the other side of the field. I can't see if they hit Randall stick or Deluca stick. But in my head, I'm like, all right, boys, like, kind of like, sure, the refs might have, like, not gotten the correct call, like, the correct clock. But I was like, it's milliseconds. Like, it's human error. It's not that crazy. As long as it was, I was like, holy fuck. Like, how do you blow it that bad? 
Yeah. And, and I mean, I guess that's not necessarily on the, re- I mean, the, the reset could be on the rest, could be on the rest. a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean the, the, whoever the shot clock operator is and I'll be honest, like it has been an issue kind of all season long and where like, there are just like so many points throughout the season where it's like, I, I, I don't know. There are just a lot of times where like gameplay is like stopped because Maddie Palin has to like go yell at whoever's running the the shot clock to be like, yo, like get that, get that time. Right. So I don't, I don't know. It's, it's been a running error, but like at the same time, it is a part of the game. It is human error. It's a little bit more than you would, you know, mm-hmm. just really like let slide and be like, yeah, like it, it didn't have any impact at all. Like, yeah, you, you might've, you know, you might have got a, an extra couple seconds there. And, you know, in a game like this between the archers and water dogs who are so close, like that's that's the difference. And that kind of sucks. I still don't think that it takes away at all from the win. It doesn't. Um, but but that, it that's does. my main point though. Yeah, yeah. So it, I, I hate it's, it's, taking away from their win. Yeah, it doesn't take it's a part of the story for sure. Right, but I, right, I, right. but it's not it's not taking away from the win. Um, you know, not from and, us. Well. Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, I, I guess Andy Copeland and, 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 and Zach Carrier and, and maybe maybe some people who are even pretty financially invested in some of these games are, are probably uh, quite upset about it. Yeah, I mean, let's just say we were on the field, not to brag. And, I mean, the refs were hearing it. The refs I were mean, getting written out I, of the stadium. I mean, I, I, I'm starting to think you can't have Matty Palin call a game in Philadelphia. I think that I'll that might it. be the issue. I don't know if the stage is too big. I think that Philly is too big for Matty Palin. Because that, I'll that's, say it. Go ahead. Can I, get, can I get the slander going? Because I'll get it going. I'm, I'm ramped up and ready to go, Jordy. I can't. I, I, I don't want to say that I was officially the first Matty P guy. But there was a time where Jake Shitter was on this podcast, and I was saying, face of the league, Matty Palin, you – it, it was hard to find. Like I was on Maddie P before he started selling his jerseys. I, I feel like we we started the to train to start selling. Right. We we wanted the Maddie P uh, right. shirt. Right, the, the right. Jerseys. I didn't know where you stood. I don't know where you stood on it, but I'm glad to hear. It. Like yeah, I, I didn't remember my memory exactly, but yeah, we were huge Maddie P guys. And you know you shouldn't really. So I think in college basketball, say this is a guy named Teddy Valentine, TV Teddy. Everyone knows when Teddy Valentine comes onto the TV, Teddy's going to make it about himself. Teddy likes likes the drama. He likes to make the games about himself. He likes to do the – has a, a flair for the dramatics. Big-time calls and big-time spots that he probably doesn't need to overstep his boundary that much right there, right? The fact that we're selling Matty P jerseys, Matty P fucks up in the Final Four game, and then to do that again, to fuck up in the championship, we got to stop selling his jersey, boys. We have got to stop making. I'm I'm looking and, for what we could call Maddie, but like we kind of kind of got to find a TV Teddy nickname for Maddie Palin. Yeah, I mean it, it. It it he really is a look at me, Maddie. Um, you know, it, yeah. it, it, it makes a lot of things. About, like, I will say between between this and and the fuck up in the final four, like it might be a good time to start to pipe down a little bit. Like maybe maybe don't be so quick. Like you know that you're mic'd up. Maybe don't throw so much sass at all these guys, at, at all these coaches and players, because like at the end of the day, you're kind of fuck them a little bit here in, in, in these big moments. So like if they're pissed off at you, like I, I think a guy like Andy Copeland, a guy like Zach Carrier, we saw like Carrier was ripping into him on that next face off. Uh, Scarpello was ripping into him after that next face off. Like, like these guys are like, I, I know that no one, in a perfect world, like you don't have players and coaches and fans yelling at refs. Like, yeah, I, I get it. Like they've got a really tough job. It's, it's, it's a really, really tough job to get all the calls right all the time in, in real time. I get it. I, I sympathize with them a little bit, but at the end of the day, like these guys kind of like, it means a lot to them and they're going to get pissed off, especially in the heat of the game. So like, all, all I'm saying is maybe stop being so defensive when guys are like freaking the fuck out at you. Yeah. I, I think that in the, in the, in the final four, I had Maddie's back, like trying to defend him. Cause I was like, I know he won't do it again. I know. I know he's the best in the biz. You, you got, you got the shot clock, right? Which is fun. I know maybe the end line call wasn't exactly his call, but as a ref unit, like, you know, it's one of those things that it, it, 
if a lineman gets penalized in football, the team suffers. So if one of your guys, you're, you're the lead guy, you're the guy with the mic, if one of your guys misses that end line call as well, it's like, Jesus Christ, you can't miss three calls for the same team in a minute and a half left to go in the most critical well, yeah. So, the so real real it's, quick, yeah, let's let's hit on the end line real quick. And I'll then and then um but so and, and then we'll we got like a little bit more Matty Palin to go here, but as much as I would love to shit on refs, I, I don't want it to be the main story. But the end line one is so the end line one, the this is you know the the ensuing I guess this is the the next uh, because the Water Dogs end up winning that face off after the Tom Shriver goal. They go down, they miss a shot, and in real time, as I'm watching, like I, I saw Sowers kind of pull up, and like as I'm watching that, because like, like we were sitting down on that end of the field, and like I'm I'm watching Sowers, and I'm like, dude, like what what is he doing? And then like immediately at like I understood what he was trying to do, right? Like that ball is like slowly going out of bounds and he knows that the rule is that you can't, it's closest to the end line when the ball goes out, but you have to be in the field of play. So you got Connor Marr. So first off, I mean, Sowers is kind of making sure that he's staying right at the ball, but he's not. And then Connor Marr comes sprinting like a madman dives and if you really slow it down and you really Oops. zoom in and you break it down frame by frame, there is a chance that Connor Marley like, just beat the ball out of bounds by like a fraction of a second. With that being said, championship game, everything's on the line. You're down by one. I get Sowers really understanding the rule and, and really thinking that he was doing the right thing in that moment. But I do think that he overthought that one. I, I don't think that any ref in America would have called the ball Archer's ball had Sowers like sold out for that one. Like in that moment, in that time, I don't know if they're like, I, I get that maybe the right call, what like the wrong call was made on that one. But at the end of the, it's like the final minute of a championship game, like sell the fuck out for that ball. And if, if they like get you on, on being out of bounds and like hats off to them, but I don't think anyone's making that call. So like, I, I will say, and I love Michael Sowers, but I do think that he overthought that one. That that's he was he's uh, he got fucked up by knowing the rules too well. I was saying this actually to Sowers in a way where I was like, I said this to you in real time with the Graham Hassa kick because I'm sure Archers fans or Archers players if they're listening or family members, or whatever they're probably listening, being like, well, they're just like talking about it. They're like, calls didn't go our way either. The Graham Hassa kick. I said clean. But when there's a hit that big, it looks so illegal that you just have to call it. Yeah, and that is the way that the game's going. I mean, if if you right. if, if a hit is like so if a hit is so loud, it's gonna get called every time. And like anyone who's been around the game over the past ten years knows that that's the case. So I totally agree. Graham Hasek hit as clean as could be. If anything, hospital passes need to be penalized because they're you're almost it's like a it's a free penalty you're gifting yourself a free penalty by getting your boy fucked up because you throw a hospital pass you're going on a power play coming up because you're gonna get your guy fucked up so hard that the refs have to make a call so going off that sentiment connor Moore was trying so hard to go out there like since he dove and it was a close call the refs probably were just like oh we gotta give it to the guy that's running so hard yeah, exactly. And that's what I was saying that Sauer yeah. should have done. He just yeah, he, right, he, right. He, knew, the, he yeah. knew the rule too well, and it, and right, that right, right. that came back to bite him in the ass. The same way, you know, that Graham Hasek hit uh, Ben Randall too hard that it came back to bite him in the ass. And I was glad to see that the Water Dogs didn't score on that power play. Um, lacrosse guys kind of making sure that they and I, I think that the Archers ended up scoring man down there, if if I recall correctly. So yeah. Lax God's evened everything out on that one. So Archer's definitely, I mean, Archer's won a championship. I don't think that they're thinking about the refs at all right now. Um, but even still, Lax God's made sure to, to even that one out. Yeah, but we are, we're the podcasters. We, we need the stories. We need the drama. We like, we, we live for this shit. Um, but yeah, I mean, they, they were definitely the two best teams throughout the entire season, in my opinion. Um, it would be, uh, it'll be intriguing to see, you know, with free agency where teams, get better where teams get worse, who leaves, who stays teams. Um, I know a couple uh, archers are set to hit free agency. Water dogs are going to reload next year. I, I, I see them coming back. Not maybe, maybe better than ever. 
I, I think they're just they're going to be great for the next couple of years, whether their contracts are working out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know off the top of my head right now, like who's up for a contract with the archers, but I mean, keeping... like Ambler, does Ambler go out on top? And I know you're like, well, he's not like Tom Schreiber going out, but like that's Schreiber's best friend, someone that Schreiber probably confides in in the locker room, somebody that your MVP best player has trust with on the field. Just getting a good rookie doesn't automatically equal that it's going to feel the same connection, the same trust. So, yeah, I, I feel like Ambler is one of those guys where like it, it doesn't matter what his stats are on the game, like he's. Right. going to be such like he's, he's a locker room guy who's also like like usually you say a locker room guy about a guy who like sucks but is at least like a fun teammate to have around like Am ryan ambler is a locker room guy who's also sick at lacrosse um now he didn't have any like he didn't have but he had i think he had like five shots in this game um you know so he was still he's still out there play, but you know I, th I think you need a guy like that like you need a leader like a ryan ambler out like you got to really just try to I think that if you can keep this group together, they still got a couple really good runs at this thing. Yeah, because, they still, you know, they still have shit. I mean, dude, the moves that they made in the off season, um, you know, I, I think that it's it's a good time for Chris Bates to really take a victory lap here. Like you, you think about what they did, where you know, breaking up that core and bringing in Mac O'Keefe. Mac O'Keefe had an insane, insane season first year with the Archers. Uh, ends up, you know, being tied for the lead with points with, uh, for the Archers in yesterday's game. He had three goals and an assist. So four points out of Matt O'Keefe in a championship game. Uh, they give Brett Dobson the keys to the cage, put him between the pipes, uh, you know, and unfortunately, Adam Gettleman, see you later. Uh, Brett Dobson, championship game MVP. You pick up Mike Sisselberger in the – in the draft, he goes 58% in the championship game and adds a goal to the mix. Uh, it was a tough, like, first half for Sis where he was winning a lot of face-offs, but by design for the Water Dogs, just using prevent, letting Sisselberger pick up the face-off and then causing him to, to turn it over, and then they get the full 50-second uh, shot clock on the way back. But he's still winning draws, impacting the game that way, and a huge goal. Uh, so – Bang, bang, bang. Three new additions to the team. Three major players in yesterday's championship right. game. And on top of everything, Reed Bowering. I mean, what a, what a, what a story he is, right? So uh, Connor Fields officially ruled out. And I, I don't think that, like, that was surprising to anyone. Like, Connor Fields got fucked up in that game. Um, what was surprising again, that he practiced. <laughs> yeah, and that that's a testament to how tough that son of a bitch is. But he's, you yeah. know, he's – Buffalo, Rochester, like he's Western New York tough. So um, not all that surprising that he was able to at least practice, but also not all that surprising that he wasn't playing. So you have a guy like Reed Bowering just waiting there in the wings. Uh, I mean, kid had a sick career at Drexel, won a Minto Cup with Coquitlam in the um, when he was playing junior. He's the, I don't know if he was rookie of the year in the NLL, but he was like transition player of the year in the NLL. So Great NLL player, so he's already a proven pro. You have him just waiting there. He comes in, uh, first PLL game that he's ever played, and it's a championship game, and he scores a goal. So, again, credit to Chris Bates on that one for just having a guy like that ready to go. Yeah, and just like meeting his teammates two days before the game and then seamlessly coming in, playing a part in a win, it's, it's a very cool story. And if it was the crossover blows up one day, the 30 for 30 is going to be sick. So here's the archers that I'll read. Hating free agency, Ambler, Reed Bowering, Connor D. Simone, which I think if they lose him for the future is pretty tough. Warren Jeffrey, Matt McMahon, Rashuda. Yeah, I, I mean, there's there's key pieces. I mean, if you lose Warren Jeffrey or McMahon, that's that's tough. Ambler, if he wants to retire, just go out on top. You never know how that stuff shakes out, but. Not like major. So like, I like Augie who stepped up in the big game. Augie's going to be a terrific pro. Yeah. I, Not I, as I bad think, as other teams. I think you have enough guy, enough young guys kind of waiting there who can kind of step up where, I mean, I don't think that they'll lose all those guys. So they'll be able to keep like no. a, uh, either a Warren Jeffrey or a Matt McMahon. Um, kind of keep some pieces there. Some guys, you know, might, might be done and it's a, a good time to, you know, you, at least you get to leave with a ring. Um, 
but yeah, I think, I think this group that they have right now, I mean, they're just so loaded all over the field kind of proved themselves with the fact that they had someone up for uh, an end of the year award in pretty much every single position. Uh, so archers, listen, they, they were the best team all season long and over the history, it's still brief history of the PLL, right? It's only, you know, there were only four years before this, but like they, it was, it was getting close to, to being just perennial chokers, right? Like that, the, the narrative was going to be written down about the, the archers. It was going to be set in stone, perennial chokers, great regular season team. Can't get the job done in the playoffs. The fact that they were able to make sure that they come away with the championship this year, that gets rid of that narrative real quick. Yeah. And then for the water dogs set to set for a hit for the agency, Liam Burns, Eli Gobrecht, Matt Hasek, Charlie Kitchen, Dylan Ward, Jake Withers. I, I think they signed back up. Basically, I think they signed back Ward, Eli, Liam, and Withers. Well, it, it, depending on the face-off rules, if they want him or not. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if, if they necessarily need him, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's like it, it was weird watching the face-off situation yesterday play out because there was a there was a moment where like Zach Hurt, like he finally just was like, hey, maybe I'll like try to win this face-off real quick. He did. And then he ran down the field, shot, scored, and was like, I don't, I don't know. Like sometimes, like the the prevent, I think is just there's a fine line there between whether you're like thinking way too much about the like if you're making it that complicated, um, maybe just every once in a while just go out and play lacrosse, and that's what like Zach Harrier yeah. did on that one where wins the face off, goes down, scores, um, won the face off when when they really needed it after that Schreiber goal, so. Uh, you know, you have a guy like that. I don't know if you necessarily need a face-off guy. If you have a guy who you're comfortable, who can do the prevent, but then can also actually take some face-offs. Yeah, I think pound for pound, he's my favorite lacrosse player to watch. Like outside of like the goalie position and like and just like a pure. Just, I, like, I, I, bet, I bet if you, I player. bet if you put him in net, he'd still get a, a shit ton of saves. Yeah, like, like, he, like like whatever you need him to do, he'll do it. Yeah, like if you if you had to like if I had to give him a cross, I'd be like, hey, you got to play any position. Zach Courier. Yeah. Face off, um, defense, offense, long stick. Like, never seen him with long stick. I'm sure he'd be an LSM of the year. Uh, sneaky, underrated guy in that same realm, Challen Rogers. To, to see Challen sure. Rogers out there. With, 100%. With a, with a, he had a long pole in it for like five minutes yeah. yesterday. Yeah. And like, yeah. I, I kept like looking at I was like, who the fuck is it? And then finally That's, pieced yeah. it together that they, they threw a pole in his hand. So, uh, yeah, good to see John Rogers, champion. Uh, very underrated, just five-tool player. But I yep. would still put Zach Carrier above him in that. I'd put Zach Carrier above a lot of people. So fair to put Challen Rogers though, right there. He had it, like, I mean, he's had, had a terrific season and playoff run. Huge pickup for the Archers. Uh, I'm totally fine with you saying that. Yeah. I'm um, trying to think. Any, anything else from the game? Lyle Thompson? Uh, Lyle Thompson well, would be pretty good with any – yeah, I don't know. Just any team could use him. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I, – I, I mean, think, any team would be better with him. Yeah. I, I think yeah. He's, he's a fantastic role player. I, I, I would agree with that. I think that Ed, he helped off-ball defense tremendously. Um, oh, I will say, uh, the, so the, the, the crowd in Philly, the – so the, very, very uh, heavily leaning towards water dogs, which – I think in hindsight, we'll, we'll be a little upset about that because I feel like at this point you have to put the archers as the Philly team. Um, so it might be a little bit awkward if, if we were rooting against the hometown champs. Uh, but, the, but the crowd in Philly breaking out the defense chance late in the second half, I want to say that they were three for three in big time stops with the defense chance. So uh, anyone who's saying – I don't know. I, I actually don't think that anyone's saying this, but what I will say is that the crowds play a, played a big role in that game, keeping that one tight just just long enough for the Water Dogs to make a nice little comeback there. So three for three on the defense chance. Water Dogs coming away with big stops. Yeah, and like Nestler sitting backstage, we're not going to call him out, make him feel. Uh, but he he said he'd be rattled if he heard a defense chant. It's a lot of pressure. But pressure makes diamonds. So. Yeah, yeah. And diamonds break the rings for Cabrini 2019 champs. 
Also makes the rings for the archers. PLL champs right. 2023. Uh, anything else from the game before we bring Nestler in? He, I, I feel like he's probably got a couple curse of the week nominations. Um, no, I, I don't got anything. Uh, no, it's really it. I'll bring in, I'll bring in Nestler. Big, big UMass guy. I'm on mute. Uh, no, uh, this is UMass shout out Dukes pick of the week, UMass football. Um, you know, that, that bet didn't hit, but that's okay because, because we made it all back on Ohio state and that that's what friends do for each other. When one lets the other down, the other one picks them up. So I want to get a little UMass football. We're hopefully going to bury them behind us. That's why it's behind me. We're going to move forward. But, uh, yeah, not a big UMass guy, but Dukes is, or was, hopefully. Yeah, no, so you gave you gave out Colorado because you, you just had a feeling. You just had a feeling, and they, they gave no shot sign of life. At least, just at, least I gave, at least I gave us – at least I gave us something. Something just to fight for. It's worth – it's the fights and the battles you go to – you go to wars with your brothers. You gave me I a dead body. Have, you gave I me a dead body. You gave me I a did. dead body in Colorado. A dead body. I Dan, bet on them. Dan Lanning's they, laughing in your face right now. <laughs> I bet on Colorado and they died in front of me. That was my fault, but I did not give that out to anyone. So if you bet in Colorado. I'll check the stats. You text, you text me. I got a feeling about Colorado. I texted you just my picks. <laughs> oh, fuck. Maybe I did. Maybe I gave it to you. Maybe I gave it to you. If I did, you're dead. But I know you, you're on your match together. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. All but uh, what a weekend. What a weekend in Philly. Wet weekend. I believe Dukes at one point was quoted saying, I am I am extremely wet right now, um, which was just a, a great Pause. quote there in the third quarter. <laughs> um, I have a few last cursed of the weeks. What about a cursed of the year? Oh, it's in there. All right, here we go. First cursed of the week, honorable mention. Jordy from Barstool. Barstool Jordy all over the barbecue. He's slapping meats. He's serving meats. Whoa. He's giving it to the drunk people. We're awesome. Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was unbelievable food. Uh, he had to make it for a lot of people. He, he, was, he was in the lab for, I believe, it was 24 hours. So shout out to Barstool Jordy for that. Uh, thank you for your service, Jordy. Big another honor, big curse, honor. Another curse of the week, honorable mention. Another Barstool guy. Jersey Jerry, the Steelers Army appreciates you. We're waving our terrible towels. Calvin Austin, he calls it anytime, and he was all over Kenny Pickett, one and a half touchdowns. I love it. Steeler Nation loves it. Thank you, Jerry. Last curse of the week. Another goalie, Brett Dobson, the tournament MVP, the game MVP, however you want to put it. Congratulations, Brett, on your second ever curse of the week, which brings us down to the wire here. Who's going to bring home that last curse of the year title? There was there was a lot of talk in the beginning that Cole was getting snubbed. I had people tell me the game that Cole was getting snubbed. The committee heard that. His name got thrown in for curse of the year. Slapped right out. That's a loss for Cole. Not cursed of the year. Connor, not cursed of the year. Caden, not cursed of the year. CJ, not cursed of the year. Cursed of the year. Colin, motherfucking cursed. He brings home the most curse of the weeks. He is the curse of the year. I'll be handing them out randomly throughout the rest of the year. And we'll be getting the committee back going in the spring. So we will see. But final cursed of the year is going to the one and only Colin cursed. Wow. That, that was unpredictable. <laughs> the people are shocked. We will be mixing it up going forward. We had to let the people know, hey, listen, this award is about one thing, and you can do what Colin Kirst can do. You'll win the award. Um, so it, it's been an honor, Kirst, of the week. It's uh, it, it has come to an end for the season. It, it, it will be back. Well, we'll, we'll be waiting with bated breath. <laughs> and congrats to, to Colin Kirst on uh, just overcoming all odds, so many obstacles in his way to, to become curse of the year. Uh, so to see an underdog like that just rise up the ranks in, in, in the curse rankings is uh, just truly 
an, an inspiring story for all. So congrats to him. Uh, you got uh, anything else for us? Um, I mean, I got to say thanks. It was a great summer. It was a great weekend. I feel like uh, a little puppy just following you guys around. I'm like, oh, yeah, baby. I got, I got my big dogs <laughs> around. So it was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. And uh, we got tuned up. So it, it, it was a blast. I can't complain. What was your uh, what was your favorite part of the intern experience? What was your least favorite part of the intern experience? Um, least favorite part is right now it coming to an end. That's that's wow, my least favorite answer. part right now. Um, that that has to be the worst part. It really was like a lot of fun. Like I said, you guys thanked me a couple of times, but really, it's I really appreciate you guys for letting me do it. My favorite part, um, I I think it was. Uh, I think it was getting the chance to the curse of the week segment. I think I got that first, <laughs> first minute and it just sort of came to me. We went with curse of the week and that was, that sort of grabbed hold and then cop sort of kept me going. So I think I'm going with getting, being, being, having the honor to present that award was my favorite part. I am, I am shocked that you didn't, I, I thought this whole time, because he was saying all these really nice and sweet things, I thought this whole time you were just setting him up so that you could kick him out of the chat as he was talking. <laughs> no, that would be way too smart of me. Don't kick me um, out. No, no, no. Uh, do you have any closing remarks just to the fans or anything? Like, um, just stay, stay tuned, baby. <laughs> I mean, Nessa, what a scumbag. Has nothing at all to say to the fans. <laughs> the, the people yeah, that yeah, just... Yeah. The the people that pay his salary, yeah, just nothing. That was crazy. You um, see him smirking back there. Uh, well, I'll, I'll say I'll say. Listen, Nestler might be a scumbag and hates all the fans, but uh, speaking for everyone here, always appreciate everyone who tunes along. Uh, you know, all, all season long, dating all the way back to the start of the college season and all the way through this long summer with the PLL. Uh, Every time that we come on here and we record, like I feel like I'm just talking with Dukes and Nestler, and like it just ends here. Like I, I always just assume that no one's actually listening to this shit. Um, so the fact that you know we're able to go to these events and meet people who are like, hey, like we love the podcast, like hey, like just listen to it on the way to the game, like that will never not be surreal to me because the whole time I'm always like nobody listens to this so Same. when you know when when i find out that you guys are listening and you know that you guys are, are appreciative of you know the episodes that we put out uh can't really explain how appreciative we are that you guys listen to this shit week after week so um you know re really appreciate all you guys love all you guys and uh just uh yeah i mean we're, we're gonna take a couple months off here it's it's a lot of lacrosse that we just went through uh but but we'll be back and and recharge as ever the uh, this is from the office of um, the Cabrini Lacrosse, not from Matt Nestler. Cabrini <laughs> alumni game, October fourteenth, last one ever. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to also just like to say thank you to the fans. I know you guys are fucking lying to me every time you guys are like big fans listen to the pod. I'm like, that's how I know you're a liar. Um, but seriously, thank you because I know that my mom's definitely listening to this because she she has to count as a listener, but um. Seriously, we wouldn't be a top 100 lacrosse podcast without you guys. And I know that you guys are in on the joke with us when we say top 100 lacrosse podcast. Um, you guys get it. Um, you can explain to your friends and family. It's probably because there's not 100 lacrosse podcasts out there. But one thing I've realized through the past couple of years doing this with Jordy, first year, you could see the momentum building. The next year, you felt it a little bit more. This year, it feels like we're, we're really taking off with this thing, um, with the podcast, with the sport. It's just becoming more serious. More people that aren't interested in the game are now tuning in. So stick along for the ride. Fastest sport on two feet. The game will grow. And um, stay along with us for the ride. It's going to be an exciting one. So thank you guys for tuning in all year. I need a break from lacrosse for the longest time. Yeah. I will uh, not be watching box across. <laughs> you nerds. No, I'm kidding. I, I will. We'll, we'll tune into a few games, maybe uh, ma make it to a Riptide game or a Wings game or something right. like that. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. Um, but yeah, it's, Dukes, that, that was that was very eloquent of you, uh, especially coming from a guy who, who's noted, self-noted, not very eloquent. So, um, what if I just said, got into I, box across as a bit? It'd be a hilarious joke. If I just got, what if I just fucked around and just fucked up the box across world? What if I did? Maybe, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Stay tuned. 
Well, uh, I'll tell you what, you probably won't be invited to many Georgia Swarm games. Uh, but yeah, like, like Duke said, make sure that you guys, you know, just, just stick around with the journey for us. And the best way that you can do that is to make sure that you are subscribed to our YouTube channel. Tell your friends, tell your family, make sure you guys are following us on Twitter, Instagram. We're at the crease dive on both, uh, stool crease dive on TikTok. And yeah, in the, in the meantime, we'll be keeping it low to high till the day we die. Hugs and kisses to you all. We out. All right. Sick.